This podcast is about all things related to a disparate community of Americans without a name. We are the AM, A M M. A for Arab, M for Muslim, and another M for Middle Eastern. By heritage and American by choice or circumstance. But more importantly, we are separated and alienated from each other. It's time to get in front of the racist PR, clean out the cobwebs, and get to the business of defining ourselves. We are here to elevate AM voices. You ready to hear some tough truths? I am Banav Shemadeinejad. This is Ramesh Deen. I'm Roy Casagranda, and this is The Defining Moment. So, Dr. Casagranda, you were talking to me the other day, and you mentioned that you had a new way of thinking about modernities. Yeah, I've been working on it for a few years now, so I don't know that it's it's entirely new. And, and I wouldn't be shocked if there were other people doing research in this area, but I'm unfamiliar with it. So it's probably just me reinventing the wheel, but this is, this is what I have. <laughs> um, and that is that it depends on how you define modernity. Let's start there. What is, how, how do people, how do historians think about modernity? When does modernity typically start? What's the sort of classical way in which we think about modernity? Okay, so the, <clears throat> technically, modernity really just means one thing. 1492 AD until today. So um, anything that happened from c- the moment Columbus set sail uh, to the West f- to this moment is modern. And that's really it. So in other words, when people say the modern tank, they're, they're being really weird since, you know, the... <laughs> All tanks are modern because the, the tank came into combat in 1916. And so 104 years later, the, that tank was modern and this one is too because the last 528 years have been modernity. Um, what, what people mean when they say that is, of course, contemporary. So it's, so, you know, it's, it's the classical problem that we have in the English language and that is that everybody thinks that these different words mean the same thing when in fact... They all have very different meanings. And the, the reason that that's wonderful is it allows us to speak accurately and even in some cases become quite precise with our language. But, uh, but people are sloppy. And, you know, we conflate terms like republic and democracy and we conflate terms like a hypothesis and theory. And uh, it makes conversations awkward. This is why we need academics to come butt in and say, well, no, not actually. <laughs> Right. Or we could just spend some time reading dictionaries, which uh, might sound boring, but I think mastery of the language is actually really powerful. The connotation, not the denotation, but the connotation of modernity is, you know, the electric light bulb and, and digital computers. And we think of it as a contemporary thing. Um, and so if you define modernity that way, then, 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 then you get into a little bit of pr- trouble because we've always had technology. Um, beavers have technology. Otters have technology. Chimpanzees have technology. It's not even a human thing, right? The fact that sea otters will take a, their favorite rock and they'll hook it in their armpit and they'll swim around with their favorite rock in their armpit, right? They, they, they've, they've got so much skill that not only are they using a tool, they have a favorite tool. Oh, wow. And there's also cultural aspects to this. They will sort of intergenerationally teach tools, too. I don't know if sea otters in particular do this, but other animals do sure. this again and again. Yeah. 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 So, so, so the question is in technology, clearly there's something nuanced about the technology. And the thing that kind of struck me as the most likely way to go in trying to define the, the connotative sense of modernity was the availability of convenience. Hmm. What is um, convenience? If you were to think of a society that didn't have a lot of convenience, you you are or your household is pretty much responsible for everything. So cooking and cleaning, for example. Um, and then one way that we have in a society that didn't have an abundance of convenience, one way that you get around that lack of convenience is you have servants because then the servants do the stuff you didn't want to do. So another way to think of it is... Um, the difference between work and labor. So 
if you, if you define labor as the amount of time and energy you spend to survive, and then work is whatever is left over. Um, so you know, if I if I work, um, if I have a job that pays uh, ten dollars an hour, so it's about twenty thousand dollars a year, and uh, you know, after taxes, you sales taxes, all the taxes, what are you left with? Maybe sixteen thousand. If it takes me fifteen thousand nine hundred dollars a year to survive by the time I pay rent and and eat, then my my work is a hundred bucks and my my labor was fifteen thousand nine hundred dollars. Whereas if I'm making a hundred and fifty thousand dollars and it took that sixteen thousand dollars to survive, then then I have a hundred and thirty four thousand dollars worth of work on top of my twenty thousand dollars or nineteen thousand dollars worth of labor. Do do so, servants have to become sufficiently expensive before we start to you know evolve and search for technologies that'll make uh, convenience happen? So uh, it, that that's that's always a question with with uh, technology is it, is it coming from necessity or is it coming from creativity? Like did, did did we get this tech because we had to develop this tech or because we got developed this tech now we can develop other tech and we just did it because we could. I, and you know it's circular. Uh, I'm sure there's a little bit of a feedback loop. There used to be in social science one law, and that social science law is destroyed. It doesn't function anymore. Uh, it probably went away about 40 years ago. But the law was as technology increases, population increases. And so the great question was: is the is the technology increasing because the population is increasing, and that's how we're keeping up, or is it? That the because the technology is increasing, our food production is increasing, and that and that's why we have the extra population. And the answer is yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, because obviously they're in a feedback loop and they're doing this together. Um, I have no doubt that some tech is just the product of a whim, right? And then some tech is uh, something that we really kind of needed to develop for survival purposes. <clears throat> um, in the case of convenience. We don't need it for survival purposes. I think the answer is that once you have a certain amount of convenience, it's cheaper to jettison your servant and and just pay for the convenience rather than have the servant. So it's not so much that the servant, it's not necessarily that the servant became too expensive, it's that you realized, oh, it's just cheaper. I don't need this person to live with me anymore, it's too expensive. Because what are you paying to have a live-in nanny? Per year, it can't be cheap. I, I have no idea because I'm not in that income bracket. <laughs> the the convenience end of it is, you know, like I can go to a store and I can buy my food already prepared. I don't have to. I don't have to kill the cow and then butcher the cow, and then you know put the cow in a place where it ages to the degree that I like it aged. I don't have to do any of that. I just go to store and it's wrapped up in a little piece of plastic with some foam. And, it's, and I walk out, and all the dirty work was sort of taken care of by somebody else. When you think about it, so human beings were gatherer and hunters, uh, if you do Homo sapiens sapiens, so we're not worried about um, Heidelbergensis, we're not worried about anything before, or Homo erectus, we're just talking Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, we, were, we were gatherers and hunters for almost 450,000 years before we switched be, switched over to agriculture. And when we did, we did it kicking and screaming because agriculture is a, a crazy amount of work, whereas gathering and hunting was something that you could do with a minimal amount of labor. Um, our grocery stores are basically gathering centers. We, we've, we, we have, through technology, recreated gathering. You go into the grocery store with a cart and you gather your food and you put it in the cart. It's we're we're right back to ground zero. This is You've got the basket, you've got the goods. <laughs> exactly. It's almost as if after twelve thousand years of agriculture, we finally got to the point where we could get back to what we wanted to really do, which was gather. Mm -hmm. Which was a lot um, more fun I, too, right? There there's much less labor that you're doing on a day to day basis, much more space yeah, for yeah. socializing and culture and all of this beautiful stuff. It's a lot less stressful too, because in a in an agricultural society, not only do you have to plow the field, 
cultivate the field and then harvest the field and then store the food. But you also have to keep Bambi and Thumper away because they keep trying to eat your stuff. And then your neighbors. Your neighbors keep sneaking over and ripping up your carrots and your onions. And so you're chasing them away. And the next thing you know, you've invented warfare. And there's diseases that are rampant. It's a mess. Nobody wants to do it. All of a sudden, property matters. Inheritances matter. All of this crazy stuff comes in. We have to plan for the future. We have to wait a year before we can actually eat this stuff. Yeah. And then what if there's a drought or a flood? I can't just pick up and move and go somewhere else where there's an abundant food supply. I'm I'm stuck in that spot. Yeah. Agriculture was a disaster, train wreck. <laughs> okay, so back to the convenience thing. So if we define modernity as having an abundance of convenience, which obviously our society does today, um, because, you know, even if you live in a poor third world country, You've got cell phones. Everybody has cell phones now. I mean, the fact that I can I can talk to anybody on the planet instantaneously, uh, and for almost nothing. By the time I figure out my monthly phone bill, it's the cost is pretty minimal. Um, so so the level of convenience today is is extraordinarily high. So. And I don't know how to do the math on this. So, like, I don't know what you would do to make it so that you could say, okay, we've we've reached a point where our convenience is so high, this is a modern society. But I have examined three past societies that had enormously high levels of convenience. Ooh. Which means, then, if you define it that way, this is the fourth modernity. At least. There, there's obviously the potential that there's more. But this is the fourth modernity by that standard at least wait so so what are the three where do we have to go in history to find modernity why can't i feel so special that we have reached you know some pinnacle of civilization and are here for the first time yeah uh (laughs) everybody wants to be special (laughs) we are we've never had electric light and digital computers before but pretty much everything else Oh, internal combustion engines, we didn't do that before either. Or or jets. Or nuclear bombs. Okay, yeah, you can feel special. Nuclear bombs. Like, surely that makes you spe- That's special. That's true. <laughs> nuclear submarines with nuclear missiles on them. All right, so ancient Egypt. That's the, the first It has modernity. to start there, doesn't it, with you? It has to start there. It just has to. There's no other place to start. Um... <clears throat> So in ancient Egypt, um, it's the 18th dynasty. So in other words, it took a while to get there. What, why is ancient Egypt so special compared to these other? There were, there were other agricultural societies, right, that were going on at the time. Why is ancient Egypt so special? So I, I don't know how to, how, to, how to figure that out. Like, I don't know how much of it was just the culture, how much of it was just random dumb luck, how much of it was the environment, how much of it was the geography. Like in the case of the United States, we're so externally powerful and wealthy because of geography. It's obviously not the individuals, right? There's name an American genius. We just import them all from around the world. But even then, I mean, yeah, right. Like the Manhattan Project, they were a bunch of Jewish Germans and and an Italian. Right? <laughs> uh, but if I asked you to name German geniuses in the last 250 years, you go Hegel, Kant, uh, Schopenhauer, Goethe, <laughs> Schiller, Strauss, another Strauss, Throne of Wagner, Bach, pa- Beethoven, and then there's a Freud, a Marx, you know, there's a Heisenberg, there's Arendt, there's, there's Marcuse, like that's... There's no end. Einstein. Damn. What is the German compound word for civilizational Schreier. shame? That's what I'm feeling yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, like if you try to go elsewhere, you know, Srinivasa Ramanujan from India, and then you got Hawking from England, and then I, I think you could make an argument for, for Foucault from France, but there isn't a lot, and, and, but I got nothing here. Oof. <laughs> So, so clearly it's geography in our case. We're, so just to blow up the specialness. In the case of Egypt, for sure geography played a major role. It, the fact that there's desert on three sides and then, a, and then the Mediterranean Sea on one side made it so that the place was difficult to invade. Um, and that created enormous stability. Um, in addition to the regular flooding too, right? 
And then the flooding makes the, the soil extremely fertile. Egyptians could get three harvests a year. And, you know, per, per acre, no place on earth could produce the kind of food Egypt could produce. Uh, by the time the Roman Empire had incorporated Egypt into the empire, uh, Egypt accounted for like 60% of the total calories produced in the entire empire. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, if it wasn't for Egypt, the Romans would have never been able to field the massive legions that they could. It, even before Egypt was conquered, uh, Rome had, had gotten a really good grain trading deals with Egypt. And that's how the Republic became so big was because of Egyptian grain. And then Egypt is in the center of the world. Uh, if you wanted to trade and you had goods in Europe and you wanted to send them to India or China, you went through Egypt. And so Egypt prospered because of the, the trade. But even if you had the geography and even if you had the resources and even if you had the trade, Egypt also had reeds so they could make papyrus. And you know, lots of things were going their direction. It wouldn't be enough if you didn't have the culture to make it happen. So in other words, it's Machiavelli, right? Uh, without fortuna, all the talent in the world is useless. And without talent, all the fortuna in the world is useless. You need, you need, you need to have both. Or then there's the United States, which is just raw fortuna. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I can, I can prove it to you, our response to the pandemic that we're currently going through. It is so beyond incompetent. I, we, I mean, it's, it's literally the worst imaginable outcome. If this was a really devastating pandemic, you know, we're, we're this, it looks like this pandemic has got a two to two and a half percent mortality rate. If this was something more like a five or 10 percent mortality rate, <laughs> oh my God, we would have been hosed. That's, at this point, it's just luck that we're doing as well as we are. So I don't have an answer answer for you, but obviously geography played a major role. So what happened was when Egypt unified, right about 5,100 years ago, Pharaoh Narmer uh, put Upper and Lower Egypt together. He triggered a thing that we, uh, we eventually will call the Old Kingdom. Technically, the first four dynasties, uh, the first two dynasties aren't considered part of the Old Kingdom, but it's just simpler to lump them in there. Um, and, and the Old Kingdom is the big pyramid building event. So, so Egypt started off with pyramids, really big, massive man, human made mountains, just. So oh, it oh. wasn't ancient aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you're Elon Musk. Oh, I didn't know yeah. he bought into that. Okay. Oh no. Yeah. yeah. He tweeted aliens built the pyramids. It's okay. He's a white South African. It's totally cool for him to be racist towards indigenous Africans. Makes the apartheid I mean, money feel a little better. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> what else did you expect? Talk about walking into a field of exposing your own racism. <laughs> um, the old kingdom collapsed. And so all of its achievements, they weren't erased, but they were certainly jeopardized. And what ended up happening is a period called the first intermediate period. Uh, and that lasted about a century and a half. It was a really long period of time. And the way to think of it is it's just a long civil war. Um, Egypt had broken up into small states, and the small states fought each other. And then Egypt recovered, and it created the Middle Kingdom. And the Middle Kingdom prospered. It, it, it got things going again. Everything was looking all right. And then they got invaded. Oh. <laughs> and, and the... In terms of time, where are we right now in the Middle Kingdom? So the Middle Kingdom is around 2000 BC, so about 4,000 years ago. And the people who invaded them uh, were the Hyksos, and they had horses. And that's, that was the problem. The Egyptians didn't have the horse. The, um, and so they just simply could, couldn't stand up to an army with horses. They, the Hyksos ruled Egypt. It, they were rather unstable. Eventually, the Hyksos lost control to the native Egyptian population, and there, there were uh, the second intermediate period, and the second intermediate period also has a lot of civil war aspects to it. And then there's a guy named Ahmosa, and uh, he uh, reunifies Egypt uh, under Egyptian rule and creates the 18th dynasty, and that's called the New Kingdom. That's the start of the New Kingdom. The 18th dynasty is... 
just such a strange moment in history because it it its prosperity and its development and its success is unprecedented. No place on the planet had experienced anything like what they experience. And but to make things more interesting, our arch, the archaeological wealth they left behind is so amazing that we have details. So there was a village west of the city of Luxor, west of and the western side of the Nile. Deir el Medinet is what it, what it's called today. And uh, that village was a village of artisans. They were tomb makers. And they left behind such a massive archaeological footprint that they lived there for 400 years. That village was inhabited for 400 years. That we know more about the people living in that village than we do about people living in any random given town uh, in the United States 150 years ago. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, we, we know who lived where, we know their names, we know when they went to military service, we know what they ate because we have their grocery lists. We, we, we know what their laundry was because we have their laundry lists. So this is, we, we have the, they, they had grocery what? stores and laundromats then or some equivalent. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's yes. incredible. And, and they wrote letters to each other and they, lo- they wrote love poetry and we have it all. It's, it's insane. And the reason we have it all is because they were tomb makers. When they would big, they would cut the tomb into the limestone. The the extra rock they would use it to practice on. But then they had so much extra rock, they were also using it to write their grocery list, and they were using it to. And then when they were done with whatever thing, they just threw it in this pit, and this garbage pit then became a gigantic record of the day-to-day life of the people living in that village because it was rock instead of paper. Because, right, Egyptians had invented paper. They were papyrus, right? And they had been using paper, but paper decays. But because this village was so weird in the sense that they had all this rock they didn't know what to do with, they ended up making it so that we could we could have this in really detailed, intimate record of their day-to-day life. And so... The con- you're, you're aiming at it. They had laundromats and they had grocery stores. There's the convenience. That's incredible. That's astonishing. Ugh. And so, and the, the, the groceries would be brought to your home. So you would send the list out and then they would bring you the groceries. And then your laundry would be picked up and taken and cleaned and then brought back to you. And uh, what, what class of people would be able to access this kind of service? Is this so just they, for so the elite that they were able to do this? No, they would have been what we would think of as middle class um, professionals. So probably upper middle class um, because they had they were artists. And as a result, uh, their skills were needed in the tombs. So uh, in ancient Egypt, they didn't start making the tombs in the New Kingdom until the pharaoh died. And then they needed to get the body in there really quick. I, I want to say, the, I'm probably wrong about this, but the thing in my head is two weeks. So they had two weeks to tunnel through the limestone hundreds of feet into the ground and then go in there and smoothen out the walls and then go back in there and draw what they're going to put on there. But then they got to carve it because it's got to be in relief. And then they have to paint it. So and... you've got to have a whole set of experts ready to go. Ready to go. And they would just go in there and they, and, and to do this... Each person had to contain all the knowledge of exactly every step that was going to take place for, for multiple reasons. One, if I'm working here, I need to know how wide I need to, how much space I have, because if I make it too wide, I mess the guy up down the line. So I, I have to know what, what, what's going on to my other side. And then what if somebody's sick and I need to replace them? Right? What if somebody gets injured and they need to be replaced? In other words, these, mar- these artisans had to work as a community, they had to work fast, and they had to have incredible skills. So, they would, so as a result, they were paid by the state uh, what we would think of today as really high wages, but here's the, here's the twist. There was no money. What? They didn't have coins. What? Yeah, we think the oldest coin on Earth is about 650 BC. So somewhere between 625 and 650 BC. That's so recent. And, and I'm talking about 1550 BC. So it's about 900 years before the first coin. 
how do you how do you coordinate such complex high level activity at these levels without money? What, what do you do? This is how much capitalism has infected our brains. We can't even comprehend how you could operate a high a high tech society because they were totally high tech. They they were building human made mountains that were precise. I don't mean accurate. I mean they were precise. The, 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 the pyramids on the Giza Plateau are perfect compasses. Actually, they're, they're off by a tiny amount, but we now know that it's not because they were built that way. It's because the earth has, has shifted. Damn. <laughs> and we, now, we actually use the, the Khufu Pyramid to measure how much the earth has shifted over the last 4,600 years. Um, the, the, the ancient Egyptians were taking such precise measurements of stars that they noticed the regularity of the Al, Al, uh, Al-Ghul pulsar. It blinks on a, like a 2.86 day increment or something like that. Well, astronomers today have, they, they have a mathematical equation about this pulsar and how frequently it should be blinking. And... Um, it should, I, I don't remember if it's supposed to be increasing over time, the interval, or decreasing. Whichever way it was, it would have been really great if they had some data from several thousand years ago so they could, t- and of course, they do, the Egyptians had it. So they went and looked at the data that the Egyptians had, and it, it matches their model perfectly. Oh my goodness. So the Egyptians were taking extremely accurate basically it, measurements of this thing. And by the way, they integrated it into their calendar and it became part of their religion. They, they, they thought Al Ghul was a really amazing uh, phenomenon. It, it blinks. It's a blinking star. That, it's not like a twinkling star. It's a blinking star. It goes bing. And so they thought, oh, that's really cool. And they integrated it into their calendar. And so you can see the periodicity of the integration and it, and it matches up perfectly with what we would expect would be the case. Um, here's a really weird thing. Al-Ghul means in Arabic, because the Arabs named the star, and we use the name that the Arabs used, uh, it, it means the ghoul. It's where we get the word ghoul, which is, of course, a, a person who eats the dead, the de- dead humans, right? And then in European mythology, it became the person who would, who would hang out at the cemetery and eat the corpses. Um... We now know it's a binary system, and there's a black hole tearing a star apart, and as the material falls into the black hole, it's shooting off these giant X-ray blasts, and that's what we're seeing, these X-ray bursts. Somehow, when the Arabs named this star the ghoul, they were smart enough to figure out it, it, that there was a black hole eating a star. How? What, what in the world? I'm, I'm getting chills. <laughs> I, I have no explanation. <laughs> and, and for some reason, the ancient Egyptians, even before the Arabs figured that out, were obsessed with the star. Those Egyptians in the 18th dynasty who are figuring stuff out like that are the, are the people who are going to build the world's first empire. They, they send armies into Palestine and Syria and, and what is today Turkey, and they conquer a huge chunk of land. Uh, they actually conquer northern Sudan, and they even conquer part of eastern Libya. And they make an empire. Uh, it, and I'm defining an empire as a state that rules multiple countries. Right? So they, they had left Egypt, and they are now ruling Palestine and Syria. Um, and, and they had sort of a capitalist eye to this without currency, but they still need resources, right? Like they wanted, for example, cedar. Um, uh, they, they, they wanted uh, mineral wealth, right? They, 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 they were there, they were there in, in an imperialist way. They weren't necessarily kind. But here's one of the crazy things. To do this, you had to draft an army. So there was a, there was a draft, and we have their letters that, this, that the soldiers were writing home. And they sound like letters that you would expect to read from soldiers today or emails from soldiers today writing home. Um, you know, the ancient Egyptians called any place that was in the middle of nowhere Yar. And so, the, you know, it'd start off, hey, mom, dad, miss you so much. Here I am in the middle of Yar. <laughs> My life sucks. I can't wait to get back to home. <laughs> Just 
stuff you would expect. Or we have letters from when they're in basic training, right? Because they had they had basic training. And then the soldiers are like, my arms hurt from doing so many push-ups. This sucks. I hate this place. <laughs> Which is what you what we get now is the same whitey crybaby suffering. <laughs> because we haven't changed, we're still the same species. That's so beautiful uh, to be able to relate on such a human level to these individual stories. Wow. What what happens to this this modernity to this empire? Where does it go? So something really really amazing happens. There's a guy. His name is Amenhotep the Fourth. He was never meant to be pharaoh. His older brother dies. And so Amenhotep suddenly finds himself in the position of becoming pharaoh when his father, Amenhotep III, died. And this is pretty far into the dynasty. Um, so you, if you've heard of Hatshepsut, she was, she was part of the 18th dynasty. And then Tuhutmos III uh, was part of this dynasty. To, just, just to give you an idea, Hatshepsut was a woman pharaoh. And uh, her uh, stepson was Tehutmos III. Uh, it's possible that he poisoned her because when it was time for her to step down as regent, she didn't. Oh. Mm -hmm. And he desecrated her tomb. Although it, we think we found her body, but we're not a hundred percent. I'm not a hundred percent. I think. It, I think uh, <laughs> the Egyptians who found her body are a hundred percent, but I'm I'm nine ninety percent <laughs> certain it's her. He was one of the two greatest military minds in human history. Tuhutmos III uh, was in 17 military campaigns. And if you average uh, even just four battles per campaign, that works out to 68 battles. And we know he never lost a single battle. And, and so if it, if it is four, actually if it's three, 17 times three is 51, that would make him the... the Military commander with the highest number of wins and then zero losses. Number two is Khalid ibn Walid. And he won 49 battles. And then the 50th battle wasn't a defeat, but it wasn't a win either. So it was kind of a draw. Uh, he, he had 3,000 men and he fought 200,000 men. And he got his men out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of think... He gets the win, but technically on the field, he didn't yeah. win. <laughs> it was his first battle. What? <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah. And I think that was it. I think everybody realized, okay, this guy is a genius. Yeah, keep him he, up. He needs to just always be in charge. I don't know how we lived through that. <laughs> That's incredible. And it was against the Romans. The, the, he wasn't even meant to be in command. The commander stepped down and said, do you want to take command? We're going to die anyway. He's like, yeah, I'll do it. And he got them out. Um, so Tehutmos III, he's the guy who really expands the empire. Hatshepsut really kicks it off. She, she, by the way, was sending trade expeditions. Uh, she discovered new countries that they didn't never heard of before. She really got, she was, she was a big thinker. Um, Tehutmos III took the empire one step further. Then the empire went into a period of there was so much prosperity and they were doing so well that I think uh, I think what happens when a society gets like that is you, you kind of you lay back on your laurels. You're feeling good about things and and you don't strive like you did before. But then we get to, to Amenhotep IV. Um, Amenhotep IV decided that he didn't like the Pantheon. Oh, so, you know, the major god in the, in the 18th dynasty was Amun, and Amun was the god of Luxor, so, and Luxor was the capital, and so uh, he'd become, Amun had become the, sort of the chief god in the, in the pantheon, even though Ra was obviously at, at some level extraordinarily powerful too, so they merged him, and they made Amun Ra, and they were like, problem solved! <laughs> He's both! Isn't this cool? Um, and, and uh, Amenhotep IV decides the Pantheon doesn't make any sense. Isis and Osiris and all these gods, and he throws them out. He says they, they, they're done. It's unclear. Do they never exist? Did, they, did he delete them? But he throws them out, and he says there is only one god. Huh. There are no other gods. And that god 
is this the first time we see a, a monotheism? Yes. Ah. This is the first evidence of a monotheistic religion. It was about 3,500 years ago. Ah. And he said there is a god. His name is Aton. A-T-O-N. Sometimes it's spelled A-T-E-E-N. The reason why we don't know is because he, in ancient Egyptian, they left the vowels out. So we're stuck looking at Coptic to try to figure out what we think the vowels might have been. But it's always a guess. Um... And Aten was the god of the sun and love. Huh. Mm-hmm. And so if you worship the sun and love, you're set. And so basically Egypt had, had adopted this hippie religion and collapses. <laughs> now, it doesn't collapse as hard as it did at the end of the Old Kingdom. By the way, one of the reasons it collapsed so hard at the end of the Old Kingdom is leadership. Um... The pharaoh at the end, his name was Pepe II, but just with the name Pepe, you know you're in trouble. And actually, Pepe might not have been the pronunciation again, because we don't know what the vowels are. I actually think there's a high probability his name was Pepe. Pepe II. But but we'll go with Pepe. <laughs> <laughs> Poor bastard. Like, what was his parents thinking? You can't go anywhere from there with a name like that, No. Yeah, and he was Pharaoh for about a hundred years. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. We, th- I think we think he died around a hundred and six, and he became Pharaoh as a child, and that is the longest any monarch has ever ruled in human history. And he was an incompetent moron, and the state just crumbled around him. And the instant he died, everything just fell apart. He destroyed the deep state and lived lived way too long, and. That was the end of that. Um, in the case of the end of the Middle Kingdom, right, it was an invasion. That's what dropped them. This collapse that happens in the, in the, in the, at the end of the 18th dynasty isn't catastrophic. It's, it's just the, the government falls, not even the state. The state's still intact, but the government falls. And the reason is, is because the Egyptian people aren't ready for this change in religion. Wait, Dr. Professor Roy Casagranda, what is the difference between a government and a state? Ah, okay. So the state is the institutions, so the bureaucracy, the laws, the courts, the military, that's that's the state. All the acronyms and agencies. Exactly, exactly. The government is the, the group that are ruling at that moment. So, it, so the government is the individuals, the, the state is the, the institution that the individuals are operating out of. And usually there is a dominant, in any given state, there is a dominant set of interests that rule. Um, and so in monarchies, we see this as a dynasty. In, in democracies or in, like us, an electoral republic, uh, what will usually happen is there's one particular ideology that will rule for a few decades, and then that ideology falls out of favor, and it gets replaced by another ideology, and it rules for a few decades, and it gets replaced. Um, and, it, and so in the case of the 18th dynasty, the 18th dynasty crumbles. It, and it, it doesn't happen all at once. It kind of falls apart. Um, Amenhotep, by the way, changed his name. Amenhotep IV changed his name to Echnaton. And uh, his wife was Nefertiti, the famous Nefertiti. And when he dies, there is a, a scramble. And uh, he had four daughters. And uh, what ends up happening is we think either Nefertiti or one of his daughters then became Pharaoh. Um, and then possibly even one of his son-in-laws became Pharaoh. Um, by the way, one of the, the the one where we don't know if it's Nefertiti or a daughter, that Pharaoh is named Nefer Neferuwatan. Why? Why would you name your child Nefer Neferuwatan? So the <laughs> like that's just terrible. It's wrong. Wasn't one Nefer enough? Nefer Nefer. Why two Nefers? <laughs> um, in any case. All that falls apart. Then uh, Tutankhamun, mm. uh, that everybody calls King Tut, becomes Pharaoh. He was married to one of uh, Echnaton's daughters. And then 
uh, Tutankhamun, of course, dies. We now think he died of a combat-related injury. Uh, he, we think he fell off a chariot and smashed his leg to pieces. And uh, this is going to blow people's minds, but uh, the femur, breaking the femur is a, a mortal injury. It'll kill you. Yeah, and so we think what happened was he smashed his femur to pieces, and that's what killed him. Um, he gets replaced by a general named I, uh, who marries his, his widow, and then that guy gets replaced by another general named Horam Heb. And Horam Heb never had uh, children, so he doesn't have anybody to pass, pass on the dynasty. But his steward was named Roy. And I've been to Roy's too. Ah. And I have to say, <laughs> it's like one of my favorite things ever, walking into Roy's too. Oh my goodness, uh, that's so uh, creepy. <laughs> it was so awesome. It was so awesome. Um, and then uh, when he dies, another general takes over and his name is Ramses. And that starts the Ramses dynasty. He's not the famous Ramses. He's the, f the famous Ramses' great-grandfather, I think. The famous Ramses is Ramses II. The reason I'm saying all of this is because of this. Nobody really knows why the 18th dynasty fell apart. The, the obvious explanation is that Echnaton's changes to the religion harmed the state. But what if there was something that harmed the state that made it so that the religion got changed. In other words, what if the effect is actually the cause and the, not the other way around? And, and here's my hypothesis, the bubonic plague. Now, here's why I want this to be, here's why this is my hypothesis. The 19th dynasty and the 20th dynasty are crap. They never achieve anything that the 18th dynasty did and the New Kingdom collapses at the end of the 20th Dynasty. The, the New Kingdom lasts 400 years. And so the, the 18th Dynasty wasn't just the start of the New Kingdom, it was the part of the New Kingdom that was amazing. And the last part of the New Kingdom just sucks. And don't get me wrong, Ramses II builds monuments everywhere, but that's really kind of all he's doing. He's building monuments all over the place, but there's no real achievements. There's no technological leap forward. Here, here's probably the most important thing the Egyptians did was tampons. Oh. They, they invented the tampon and in the process liberated women, right? I mean, think about it. The Romans did wool. They did a wool pad. And, and so women were basically confined to their house one out of every four weeks because they couldn't go out into public with a wool pad. You might as well not wear anything at that point. And whereas with tampons... You're good to go. You're good to go. And this, these types of earthquake kind of innovations yeah. that the Egyptians were doing liberated their people. But then the, 20th, the 19th and 20th dynasties don't have that kind of powerful liberation. We now think, there's, in 2004, a group of researchers think the bubonic plague may have actually started in Egypt right around the end of the 18th dynasty or maybe the 19th, into the 19th dynasty. And that might explain... Egypt's unraveling. Interesting. Would we? Why wouldn't this be reflected in any kind of record somewhere? There's a new disease about some symptoms or something like this. That's that's the problem with this. The Egyptians were so meticulous; they wrote everything down that you would think if there was a bubonic plague, there'd be writing all over the place. So uh, uh, that's uh, it's a hypothesis <laughs> <laughs> as far as it goes. I really don't have another explanation though because. Why would the culture suddenly unravel? And it, and it never really fully recovers. Um, Egypt has 32 dynasties. If you look this up, some, some places will say 30, some places will say 31. It's 32. When, when, when they say 30 or 31, they're not counting the Ptolemaic dynasty at the end. Um, the, the argument is, is they're Greeks and therefore shouldn't be counted. But uh, we count the Assyrian dynasty, and we count the Persian dynasty, and we count the Hyksos dynasties. They're not Egyptians. We, we count the Cushitic, the Kush dynasty. They're not Egyptians. Why wouldn't we count the Greek one? Oh, I know. It's because the Persians were brown, and the Kush were black, <laughs> but the Greeks were white. But by the way, you look at Greeks a little more carefully. They're, they're awful. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you grabbed a random Greek and stuck him to a random, next to a random Persian, I wouldn't be able to tell them apart. <laughs> People need to work on their racism yeah. skills. Well, they are lame. lame. <laughs>
We just have to pretend the Greeks were just like us, walking around just like us, and then those those marble statues, right? Yeah, those marble statues, which, by the way, were painted once, and the skin tones on those painting statues were a lot darker than you think. <laughs> So Egypt only approaches this this modernity, this level of convenience of of all the stuff we talked about once. Well, no, it actually does it again. Ah, uh, damn! So of your three examples of a of a pre modern modernity, two are Egypt. I didn't know I was getting into this. I thought I signed up for one Egypt at most. <laughs> I should have known. I should. I guess I should be. Should I should be grateful. All three aren't Egypt. <laughs> I should be grateful you're not claiming modern modernity as Egyptian too, which I'm sure you will. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. But how about if I told you the third one included Egypt? 